You're listening to The Reality Check, episode 393, recorded March 15th, 2016. They're always after me, lucky skepticism. This is your reality check. Hi everyone, and welcome to The Reality Check, your weekly Canadian podcast that explores a wide range of controversies and curiosities using science and critical thinking. I'm your host, Darren McKee, and with me, as usual, are Adam McGardner. What's up, McCuboids? Christina McRoach. Hello. And Pat McRoach. Diddly deep potatoes. We have a great show for you today. Adam is going to look into the Hillary Clinton onion conspiracy. Lots of layers to that one. Gonna make you cry. <laughs> and Christina is going to look into whether Splenda might give you cancer. Again. But first, we have an interview with physics commando, Barry Panas. Pat, can you tell us about that? So, a few weeks ago on episode 389, I did a segment on left-right confusion. At the end of that segment, Adam mentioned mirrors and how they seem to reverse left and right. About that comment, we got a note from Barry, who is a high school physics teacher in Winnipeg. He's also a former president of the Manitoba Association of Physics Teachers, an advanced placement physics college board consultant, and he's traveled around the world giving training for advanced placement physics teachers. All that to say, we figured that rather than trying to address his email on the show, it might be easier just to have him come on and explain. Mm -hmm. So Christina and I spent some time talking with him earlier this week, and here's our chat with Barry. Welcome to The Reality Check, Barry Panas. Thank you very much. So, Barry, let me tell you a story. The, the way the reality check works is we do these segments every week. As, as, as a listener, you probably know that. Lots of people email us uh, when we get things not quite right. And the truth of the matter is, is that they often email us about things that are offhanded comments as opposed to actual segments we did. I did a segment not too long ago about left-right confusion. And Adam made a, a comment about mirrors and how... Mirrors appear to make your left hand look right and your right hand look left. And then we got an email from you suggesting a segment. And because we're kind of lazy and you probably know more about it than us, we <laughs> thought, hey, why don't we just invite him on? So, Barry, what's going on here? Well, uh, yeah, yeah, in the offhanded comment that you made, uh, it was clear to me that you had this, uh, this common uh, and yet mistaken belief that mirrors, uh, and by which, to clarify, we're talking about just a standard flat mirror, right. uh, typical of a, of a bathroom mirror, for example, has this ability of reversing the sense of left and right, which is, I, I would go so far as to say, quote, common knowledge, uh, and the kind of thing that most people would, would believe so strongly that they, uh, they would be very surprised to find out if, uh, if it were anything other than that. So why, why is it, Barry, that, that you know so much about this? Well, I, I actually happen to own a mirror. Uh. And, <laughs> uh, and, and as a mirror owner and operator, I actually look at it uh, sometimes several times a day. Right. But there's more, <laughs> there's more to it than that, is there not? Uh, well, well, true. I'm, I also happen to be a physics teacher, and uh, this is something that came up many years ago uh, when I was actually teaching about mirrors and image formations. A, a, a very standard question that gets asked is, how is it that a mirror can reverse left-right and yet not reverse up and down? Because it seems like there should be some kind of a symmetry there, and, uh, and, and apparently there is not. So, Barry, tell me why they reverse left-right and not up-down. Well, the, the response to the question is that it was not a very good question. Right. Uh, it, it's, in fact, built upon the mistaken premise that mirrors do reverse left and right, because actually, surprise, here's, here's the answer. They don't do that. Please explain. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So this is tricky in, in audio only, but basically, if you can imagine a mirror uh, and you're looking in it, you, you tend to form the opinion of left-right reversals because there typically is a person seemingly standing on the other side of the mirror who looks a lot like you. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, uh, if you were wearing a watch on your left hand, for example, the person in the mirror seems to be wearing a watch on their right hand. Agreed. But how did I know that was his right hand? Basically, I imagine stepping through the mirror, spinning my body around, and checking his watch from his point of view. Now, in doing so, notice that I spun myself around, even if only mentally. This is what reversed my sense of left and right. Here's a better way to look at this. If I'm wearing a watch on my left hand, then when I view myself in a mirror, the handsome fellow seemingly behind the mirror is also wearing a watch on my left side. Now, of course, if we asked him, he'd claim that we're both wearing watches on his right side. 
So neither of us really have a reversal associated with the mirror. We both have reversals associated with looking things from different points of view. The best way that I like to describe it is, imagine a box that has each of its six sides painted different colors, or even better, grab something like a box of tissues and use some markers to give each side of the box a unique color. Place the box directly in front of yourself and don't turn it other than tiny amounts in order to check the colors of each side. Then place a mirror so that the box is between you and the mirror. You'll see what looks like a second box, and of course that's the reflection of the first box, seemingly behind the mirror. This mirror image of the box will have its six sides similarly colored, and it'll be pretty clear if you really do this, that the two sides that are on your left are the same color, as are the two sides that are on your right. The tops and bottoms will also match up. But here's the fun part. The two remaining sides, let's call them the front and the back sides, will appear reversed. And this is because mirrors actually do reverse images. Uh, but they do so in the third dimension. And that is the dimension that's perpendicular to the mirror's surface. So if we go back to the analogy where I'm looking in a mirror and I've got a watch on my left wrist and it appears to me I've that the person in the mirror has a watch on their right wrist. If we take the box, essentially what we're doing to do that, that switch is if we take the box and the, the left side is blue, what I'm doing when I do that watch instance is putting myself in the mirror behind the box and therefore in my new perspective, the right side would be blue. Right, yeah. So when you, when you step through the mirror, turn yourself around, you have reversed the entire world's left-right perspective from your own personal point of view. So do you have some perspective on why we're inclined to do that? Uh, well, I, I think it's, it's, it is fairly easy to make the mistake if you look at, for example, how uh, words appear in a mirror. Most people, if, if they have a, a printed page with words on it and they want to hold it up to a mirror, they will, without realizing it, uh, flip the page around so as to have the writing side face the mirror. And, and of course, in turning the page around so as to be able to view it in the mirror, you've actually flipped that page's perspective left and right, so to speak, relative to your body. Hmm. Now, now, of course, the, the, the fun thing to do, and you can actually do this, is to take a page with, with regular writing on it, and as you're holding it facing yourself, have it oriented so that it is correct, so, you know, top and bottom are correct, left and right are correct. Now, imagine turning the paper over to face the mirror, but by flipping it so that the bottom and top trade places. Just, a, just kind of a, a flip over, not just a rotation to keep it facing you, but now so that it's facing the mirror flipped over. Right. Uh, as, as if the page is somehow doing a backflip, if, if you will. Mm -hmm. If you were to view the writing in the mirror now, you'll find out that it is quite literally upside down. The, uh, the left and the right are preserved, and yet top and bottom are changed. Now, I don't think that anybody would blame the mirror for turning it upside down. Uh, the person holding the paper turned it upside down, and the mirror is just uh, reflecting that back. Interesting. Barry, let me ask you a question. Sure. I've noticed an interesting phenomenon <laughs> with people, and I'm wondering if... if if, th if this is what's happening, you know, what you're explaining about um, what we perceive when we look in a mirror. And I tested it on Pat earlier, <laughs> just to make sure. But um, if you look at someone, and they have something on their face, and so I'm looking at Pat, and I say, you have something on your face. And I point to my right cheek, thinking he's got something on his right cheek. Uh, he needs to rub it, now, yeah. rub it off but he instinctively will move his hand up to his left cheek thinking that's where the dirt is and I'm like no the other side so what's is that what's happening as well well i, th I think that probably is related i mean we're so used to looking at our ourselves in a mirror right. in in which that sense of side is preserved uh so much so uh, many people don't realize it but if you're using a uh, a cell phone to take a, a selfie photograph and you're looking at yourself in the uh in the screen it actually is doing a flip for you so that it looks like you would see yourself in a mirror. Really? I've never noticed that before. Oh, yeah, yeah, try that out. So, so yeah, no, if I'm doing Pat's it right doing now. It right now. Yeah, true. yeah, so, so if, you're, if you take a selfie of yourself now, now do something like close your right eye uh, so that only your left eye is open and take a photograph of yourself with your cell phone and then view that photo back after it's been recorded. Oh, wow. Yes, absolutely. That's interesting. That's very interesting. Wow. Yes. So, so it is basically simulating a mirrored point of view for yourself. 
uh, and yet it's recording that uh, photograph accurately as a separate person would be viewing you from the camera's point of view. Wow, that's really interesting. I had no clue. That is really cool. It was interesting to do that in real time. Well, I have to tell you now instinctively, if someone's got some dirt on the right-hand side of their face, I'll point to my left side and inevitably they'll get it right. (laughs) You know, it probably would communicate the idea better, even though I understand what you're saying about there there is an inherent uh, kind of of an unstated lie in the the process. Uh, You have it on your right side. I'll show it to you on my left side, kind of simulating that, uh, that mirrored behavior. Yes, neat. And, and so, Barry, do you find that th- this exercise, walking through this exercise, what, what, what grades do you teach? Uh, I teach mostly grade 11s and 12s, uh, some grade 10s as well. Oh, okay. boy. So fairly, fairly advanced at that point. Do you find that that's a, a pretty good example of something that, that can teach them sort of critical thinking? Yeah, I, I often use this, this whole mirror, left, right, seeming reversal thing as a, as a kind of a, an opening conversation right on the first or second day of classes. I'm not really teaching an optics lesson at that point, although we will cover those topics later. It's more of a lesson on how physics, of course, that's what I'm teaching, uh, really, really changes the way that you see the world. Uh, most people have these little hidden beliefs that they may or may not be conscious of, and in so many cases, uh, they're mistaken. They form these ideas over uh, rather careless observations, uh, sometimes mistaken logic, sometimes uh, just kind of picking things up along the way. These mistakes are, for example, often printed in textbooks. So you can't really blame a student for thinking there's a left-right reversal when they've been so-called taught it in an earlier grade. Oh, that's reassuring it, that it's in a science textbook. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that's, that's just one of many things that we, we tend to have to combat at, uh, at the high school physics level, for sure. So, Barry, uh, just before we let you go, I, I did a little bit of uh, looking online. Apparently, you're pretty infamous for tough tests. No, no, no. My, t- my tests, I always find them to be pretty easy. <laughs> you, you find them... <laughs> I've seen several students reporting on Rate My Teacher that, that, that you're a great teacher, however, your tests are a are little tough. too tough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, that's, that's something that I, I, I don't even try to uh, negate in any way. I, I try to make challenging tests. Uh, th- I guess the reason that so many of my students find them challenging is because I'm trying to push them beyond their comfort zone. Uh, not trying to you know, give them the exact same questions that they've seen before and just kind of regurgitating them from memory, uh, but rather challenging them to actually reach a deeper level of genuine understanding so that they can apply it to a situation that they're not familiar with. Uh, To to me, that's the only way to gauge uh, genuine understanding. That must be very satisfying for you. It really is in so many instances. I've had so many students who initially are complaining, you know, it's it's, it's not fair. You didn't teach us this exact, exact, exact uh, concept. Uh, And then most typically, and the, the, the way I like to explain it to my students is, I will be probably, in most cases, appreciated more uh, a year or two after I'm done with you. Right. Uh, because these students will go to university and, in so many cases, report back that, uh, that it actually it was beneficial. They, they actually did reach a, a deeper level of understanding as a result. Yeah, and it's always, t- it's always teachers like you that really resonate with us the rest of our lives that we, we realize later on, oh, wow, you know, and we appreciate what you teach. Well, as you say, your goal is to try and teach them how to think in some cases, rather than just to regurgitate information that you've given them. Yeah, that's exactly it. I, I'm fully aware that most of the facts that I'm teaching will be forgotten unless they're actively using them, if, if they go into uh, further studies in physics or engineering or something like that. But I would like to believe, uh, this, is, this is what I've convinced myself of anyway, I'd like to believe that um, the way of thinking will last a lifetime. So, you know, critical thinking, problem solving, the very things that you're promoting on your podcast, which I wouldn't say is a physics podcast, and yet uh, we're perfectly aligned in that way of thinking. Well, Barry, I really appreciate you taking some time. I hope that maybe today what you learned is that if you read into a podcast, you might just end up having to explain yourself on the air. <laughs> no, no. Happy, happy to do it. If, uh, if there's anything I can do in the future, by all means, give me a shout. Just keep fighting the good fight in Winnipeg. Will do. What a great interview. I'm glad we had him on. It was fun enough that I, I expect Barry will show back up on DRC. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Awesome. I think he highlighted a really important counterintuitive but certainly helps when you start to actually do some of the examples he suggested Mm -hmm. because a mirror is a reflection i thought i was going to mention something which is sort of tiptoed around is that when you see your reflection in the mirror most people don't see you the same way Mm -hmm. so i don't know if you've ever stood in front of a mirror with a friend and you're like what happened to their face (laughs) (laughs) and you're like that's what they always see that's interesting so uh that's what i think also the reversal comes into place because (laughs) you're like well wait a minute if my left side of my face isn't there i don't know where it is 
So the selfie example is a really good one. I, I, I suggest that everyone interested actually try it because it literally flips on you between you looking at it, snapping the picture and looking at the picture, everything turns around and it's really kind of um, striking to see that for the first time. Well, for me, it was striking to see it for the first time. Yeah, I, I always, I, I always find it weird to look, uh, look at photos versus looking in the mirror because I have a crooked nose, and my nose basically, I get used to looking at it one way, so it's doubly crooked when I look at a photo, which is what anyone else would see when they look at me. It's, uh, it takes some. Uh getting used to but i guess unless you're blessed like denzel washington with facial symmetry and you're like what it's always the same so the only other thing that i wanted to mention is that barry has a youtube channel where he actually covers some interesting physics topics so i would certainly recommend that people go check that out and i'll put it in the show notes cool great and if you also happen to be on the internet you could also go to the onion which is a fantastic satirical news website sometimes they have select print editions in certain cities maybe not anymore but now apparently they are in the pocket of Big Hillary? Adam, what's going on? It's all about ethics and fake journalism. The Onion was bought up by Hillary's top supporter, and so they aren't allowed to make fun of her, or so the headlines say. These are headlines such as, The Onion can't run satire on Hillary Clinton anymore. Readers have this man to thank. The Onion's new owner is Hillary Clinton's most lavish financial backer. Haha, ha, Hillary Clinton's top financial supporter now controls The Onion. Oh, damn. So what happened? And is The Onion really not running satire on Hillary Clinton anymore? Univision bought a 40% controlling interest in The Onion. Univision's co-owner, chairman, and CEO is Haim Saban. He's uh, one of the guys that brought us Power Rangers. Haim Saban and his wife, Cheryl Saban, have given $2 million to Hillary Clinton's campaign and some $10 million to the Clinton Foundation whose board Cheryl Saban sits on. They're also big supporters of the Democratic Party. So the idea is basically that now that Haim Saban has essentially bought the onion, they're going to control the media. First off, is it media? (laughs) Um, It's it's the onion. It's a parody site. But yes, some people are concerned with what's going to come out of this site. Um, Most people have a political preference, as do those who write parody. Uh, and own various news outlets, though most wouldn't be quite as outspoken. And is this a problem? But really, if we want to find out whether or not something's going to change, we can just uh, look at whether or not anything has changed since this recent thing has happened. We could also challenge the notion that buying 40% of something allows you to change it entirely. Um, yes, that's that's fair. I mean, who, who knows? You know, if we bought 100%, would it make a difference? It, it all depends on how he's going to run well, things. Certainly, and who things. has a majority share and whatnot. And it's not necessarily he himself. It's a company yeah. that bought it, right? It's being referred to as a 40% controlling interest, and I think that might mean mm. something. Um, that probably just means that there's no single person who has 60%, but uh, I'm not really a... It could mean they're the majority shareholder. Yeah. Um, but really, we just want to look at has anything changed? The earliest mention of this news I saw was January 19th, though I couldn't find any specific mention of the date that this uh, this this buyout happened, but we should consider it to be around January 19th, and that's what I used for my analysis. Some articles were reporting on the change after a February 16th article on the Onion had the following headline. Female presidential candidate who was United States Senator, Secretary of State, told to be more inspiring. When I originally saw this, I thought it was funny, but then I wasn't aware of the controversy. Some people who kind of knew that this was going on saw this headline and thought, oh, this is terrible. But let's look at some other headlines that have happened starting with the present day and working our way back to the, the, this, this buyout and see if there's really anything that's changed in the coverage. March 11th. Hillary Clinton appears before rally completely nude in bid for authenticity. (laughs) (laughs) Were you saying that's not true? Uh, Apparently not. I think it was photoshopped. March 9th. Clinton throws flash grenade to divert attention from question about Senate voting record. I saw that one. March 3rd. Hillary Clinton's campaign. Myth versus fact. There are jokes about her getting many corporate donors being too focus grouped, her supporting the war in Iraq, and not having a personality. March 1st, Hillary Clinton issues single word victory speech following Super Tuesday results. Satisfactory. It's a joke about her just being kind of wooden. March 1st, Clinton tosses unpledged superdelegate in trunk of car. (laughs) 
February 20th, Clinton credits Nevada victory to inescapable pitch black tide of fate. And then we're back to the 16th article that I mentioned. And before that date and going back to the 19th, um, these articles weren't particularly soft on Clinton either. February 12th, Clinton aide told to leave behind weak volunteer who collapsed during March to South Carolina. (laughs) February 8th, New Hampshire covered in in shadow as floating Clinton campaign headquarters takes up position over state. January 31st, Clinton ominously tells Iowan supporters to mark front doors with campaign logo before sundown. And January 29th, retreating Clinton campaign torches Iowa town to slow advance of Sanders volunteers. That, That would be Bernie Sanders. So these were not terribly mean, but besides that one headline, they're not terribly supportive either. This isn't really, you know, becoming a pro Hillary Clinton rag. But then we can also look at the Bernie Sanders headlines to get an idea of how things are sort of on the other side. Because if you really want to do fake headlines to make Hillary Clinton win, you should also control the Bernie Sanders headlines at the same time. March 14th. Sanders impresses Florida voters by jumping from hotel balcony into pool. March 6th. Bloated, rotund Bernie Sanders reveals he has finished drinking all of Flint's water supply. Oh, God. There's a a photo with that one. March 2nd, Sanders campaign headquarters smashed up by gang of Pinkerton Union Busters. And then we're back to February and the same kind of thing. Um, It doesn't seem like they've gone easy on Clinton at all. In fact, she has significantly more coverage than Bernie Sanders. Has the Onion's coverage of Hillary Clinton changed? It's hard to tell. Yes, a major Clinton supporter pretty much bought parody site The Onion. This may or may not have had some minor effect on the columns released, but in the past month, it doesn't look like anything has changed at all. If Haim Sabans had a subversive agenda to influence voters through articles on the comedy site he bought, he's really doing a terrible job of it. This is the time where he should really be influencing voters, and it doesn't look like he is. I was skeptical before you even got into the, uh, you know, the different headlines, because to me, The Onion, I don't know, but for the most part, I, n- I never feel The Onion's being mean. <laughs> yeah, it's just joking, Do, right? You know what I'm saying? It's, it's just it's just kind of ridiculous notions or just jokey stuff, but I, I, I really didn't think it would even be an issue because it's not like they would attack her in, in, a, in a crappy way. Yeah, can you imagine any candidate reading an Onion article and just being like, damn, those guys, they're terrible. They're always always on me. Uh, I, I, yeah. I, I have to slightly disagree only in a little sense that I've read the tons of Onion articles, <laughs> and sometimes they're horribly mean. <laughs> Usually it is something absurd that is preposterous that someone couldn't possibly think is true. Mm-hmm. But once in a while there's something pretty caustic. Usually against someone they might hate. There's Yeah, there's and there's probably just a lot of writers that are that have a lot of sort of different feelings of what's funny and what's yeah. right and wrong. Um, but True. It, I don't, uh, I, I'm not as regular a reader as you are probably, Darren, so. Onions are enjoyable. Sometimes sweet. Not too sweet. But maybe if you had some Splenda, they'd be even sweeter. Unless it gives you cancer. Christina, what's the deal with Splenda and cancer? Well, my friends, Splenda has once again hit the spotlight as the toxin du jour. Oh or for our English-speaking friends, toxin du jour. <laughs> <laughs> I started seeing news about this on Friday, so I'd like to arm all of our checkers with some facts in case the chatter around the office water cooler turns to Splenda equals cancer, which I'm sure it inevitably will in some cases. So this is the first headline that hit my radar. Splenda ingredient sucralose linked to leukemia. The article went on to say a new study from Italian researchers published in January's International Journal of Occupational and Environmental Health shows that sucralose has been linked to leukemia. Sucralose is the main ingredient in the artificial sweetener Splenda, which I'm sure most people have heard of. I was intrigued enough, I have to say, I have to admit, to say to Pat, hmm, I wonder if there's any likes to this one. And Pat, of course, reminded me that one cannot draw a valid conclusion from a single study, (laughs) the scientific method, blah, blah, blah. So (laughs) I dug deeper, and and here's what I learned. First, what's sucralose? It's a non-nutritive sweetener. The majority of ingested sucralose isn't broken down by the body's calories for energy, so it's a non-caloric sugar substitute. 
According to sucralose.org, sucralose is made through a patented process that starts with sugar and selectively replaces three hydrogen oxygen groups on the sugar molecule with three chlorine atoms. Chlorine. The researchers from the Ramazzini Institute claim their study found significant dose related increased incidence of male rats and mice bearing malignant tumors after being fed sucralose from 12 days of gestation through their lifespan, so through till death. They fed 457 male and 396 female Swiss mice concentrations of 0, 500, 2,000, 8,000, and 16,000 ppm, or parts per million. You always think it must be the chlorine that they're eating. Mm-hmm. I know, I mentioned that to Pat. People see the word chlorine and lose their minds. Uh, yeah. What are these rats in a swimming pool also? I don't get it. <laughs> They were quick to point out that their findings didn't support previous data from similar studies conducted by Splenda's manufacturer, which had concluded sucralose is harmless. They went on to say that more studies are necessary to show the safety of sucralose, but I thought the last line in their conclusion was a tad fear Quote, considering that millions of people are likely exposed, follow-up studies are urgent. Urgent. Hmm. Then do another. Chris Solid, Director of Nutrients Communications at the International Food Information Council, does a great breakdown of this study in a piece on Food Insight. First of all, let's just get something straight. Over the past 20 years, researchers have conducted more than 100 scientific studies on sucralose safety. The European Union Scientific Committee on Food, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, Food Standards Australia New Zealand, the Health Protection Branch of Health and Welfare Canada the Food and Agricultural Organization, the World Health Organization, and Japan's Ministry of Health and Welfare have all declared sucralose safe. So one study does not equal scientific consensus, as Pat pointed out. As well, the Ramazzini Institute doesn't exactly have a stellar rep for solid science. The US EPA has publicly stated they won't even rely on lymphoma and leukemia data from Ramazzini Institute studies. The FDA and the European Food Safety Authority have also publicly criticized the Institute's past work, stating that their conclusions aren't supported by data. PhD Berna Magnussen from the Fellow Academy of Toxicological Sciences and Health Science Consultants in Mississauga, here in Canada, was quoted in Solid's article as saying, It is now well accepted that the presence of chronic lung infection in the Ramazzini Institute animals and the exceedingly high incidence of cancers of the lymph and blood found in their studies are caused by infection, not the compounds that they test. Case in point. And Darren, you'll find this especially interesting because you actually addressed aspartame's supposed harmful effects back on uh, episode 151. Indeed, I did. Ramazzini declared aspartame carcinogenic in a study conducted in 2005 and then subsequent studies. However, the European Union's Food Safety Authority urgently commissioned a panel of experts to examine the study, considering how alarming the conclusion was. What they found was that many of the rats were already sick with chronic lung respiratory disease, which just happens to be the same kinds of cancer that the study attributed to the aspartame. Add to that, lead researcher Sofridi, his study design is inherently flawed. Instead of outlining a hypothesis and then testing it, i.e. science, Sofridi's team fed a bunch of animals, then tried to fit a conclusion to their data. Their data also didn't include comparisons between different treatment groups as well as the control groups. You'd think if a researcher plans to draw a conclusion regarding safety in humans, they would actually use current acceptable daily intakes. A contributing writer with Forbes named Emily Willingham asked Sufridi to clarify the daily intake of the animals. Well, her question to him was, when you say that you fed the animals 500 ppm, etc., is it correct that that also can be given as 500 milligrams per kilogram per animal? If not, how does that ppm value translate into per kilogram values? So Freddie replied, you may consider approximately 60 milligram per kilogram body weight. So the acceptable daily intake, ADI, level of sucralose is 5 milligrams per kilogram of body weight in the U.S. So he's talking 12 times more than the recommended daily limit for humans. That seems like a lot. Mm -hmm. Sweet. (laughs) (laughs) Funny in Europe, it's actually it was like twelve milligrams per kilogram. It was it was quite a bit higher than the U.S. Hmm. 
Furthermore, something left unhighlighted in the abstract was that their results also showed a dose-related decrease in cancerous tumors in the female mice. From 67% in females exposed to no sucralose to 59.4% in female mice exposed to 16,000 ppm. I have to admit, I was actually really pleased with a lot of the reporting on this study. We don't often say that on uh, the podcast. Mm -hmm. Many of the articles I read did a decent job of reporting the concerns, and some of them had, you know, headlines that that spoke to Splenda, cancer, question mark. But many of them actually addressed the flaws with the study and with the institute itself, which was actually very encouraging. So here's some advice when a story like this starts circulating. We understand that many people don't have time to do a bunch of research, and that's why you rely on TRC. At the very least, I recommend checking Snopes.com the moment your BS alarm starts going off, or if you want to corroborate something, because Snopes had an update within a day of that story hitting the news, Mm -hmm. highlighting the issues with the study and the research institute, and citing the collective scientific evidence so far supporting sucralose is safe. Yeah, and I don't mean to throw stones, but it almost seems like this particular institute that's doing this study has a particular bone to pick. Mm -hmm. Because they they seem to be... Aspartame. I don't don't know what else they've done, Mm -hmm. but it seems that they they seem to be coming to contrary conclusions about very specific things. It does seem to tilt in one direction, that's for sure. Yeah. And I think this was a great coverage, Christina. Certainly, we've learned that even from more reputable institutions and organizations, one study does not make a definitive conclusion. And whatever that study finds, it has to be meshed with all the other studies and how they found certain things. But there's also a lot of bad stats and publication biases. So trusting anything you might read in popular media about a scientific finding is probably something you should do with caution. Just before we wrap up, I thought I'd mention something for our listeners who are just sick of politics, that you could actually take this interesting moment in U.S. election history to embrace the opportunity to improve your prediction skills and acquire a better understanding of your cognitive biases and donate to effective charities. What am I even talking about? Well, former host of the show, Xander Miller, and I have a bet going about who might win the Democratic nomination as well as who might win the presidency. Now, we actually covered this on our podcast in our predictions at the beginning of the year where almost all of us said Hillary versus someone. Mm. At that time, I picked Rubio. I think I'm saying I'm wrong now that it's going to be Trump. Anyway, the, the point is that something's unfolding in the present and it will happen within the next several months depending on you're looking at the Republican or Democratic nomination versus the presidency, which will happen later. But you can try to put your money where your mouth is. And Xander and I have had a bet of who's going to win what. I said Hillary, and he thinks Trump will actually beat Hillary for the presidency, and we have some odds worked out. It doesn't matter. But no matter what, the money is going to go to effective charities as recommended by GiveWell, like the Against Malaria Foundation. So I'm trying to sort of leverage the idea of super forecasting, which I talked about on a show recently, and assigning, in my mind at least, a percentage of why I think Hillary would win and the reasons for it, so in the future I can look back and see if I was right or wrong. He's doing the same. We completely disagree. I think his reasoning is absurd, and I'm pretty sure he feels the same way, which is exactly why we're betting. So, if you just happen to be sick of it, make it a little bit more interesting, because of course the fate of the free world is not an incentive of enough. So I think that's kind of fun that you're doing that, Darren, and the fact that you're both putting your money where your mouth is, and eventually this is all going to go to a good cause is lots of fun. Way to go, guys. We'll see what happens. And thank you for joining us once again. We had a fantastic interview with Barry Panas, who showed us that mirrors are not just on the wall. They can teach you about the world and physics. Mm -hmm. That The Onion is a fantastic satirical news website and something, something Hillary Clinton doesn't run it. (laughs) 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 And that Splenda, at this moment, does not give you cancer, according to the good science that's out there. Until next week, think better to act better. Peace out, McCuboids. Happy St. Patrick's Day, everyone. One of these weeks, Christina and I will actually talk about having gone and seen Neil Neil deGrasse deGrasse Tyson. Tyson. The Reality Check is an independently Canadian-produced podcast. For show notes or to discuss this episode, visit our Facebook page and website at trcpodcast.com. For general inquiries or to send a topic or parody suggestion, email info at trcpodcast.com. Help support the show by leaving a review on iTunes and liking us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at TRC underscore podcast. Outtakes. Diddly dee potatoes. (laughs) (laughs) Was that English? I decided to not say something. (laughs)